Welcome to Motorcycle Hang Time with Chris Klotz, attorney at Stevenson Klotz Injury Lawyers. We invite you to hang with us as we talk about the local motorcycle scene, safety issues, and motorcycle law. And now, here's your fellow motorcycle rider and enthusiast and host. Hey, this is Chris Klotz with the Stevenson Klotz Injury Law Firm here in Pensacola. We are at Motorcycle Hang Time today, and we have with us the wonderful and very, very hardworking, one of the hardest working people that I know in the industry, April Violet. Welcome, April. How are you doing? I'm wonderful, Chris. How are you doing? It's Everything's good to be here. great. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us of today. Course, so of I've really been looking forward to having you on the podcast because you are one of the most well-rounded and also one of the hardest working and one of the most dedicated people that I know in the um, motorcycle community. And so give us a little bit about what you do now, um, where you're working and kind of what you do. And uh, But then I, w- I want to kind of break it down in two parts and kind of talk about your motorcycle history, riding life, yeah. and then talk about what you do uh, with your firm. Sure. Um, let's see. I, I'm currently, my title, who I am, where I am right now is I am the motorcycle advocate for the Garza Law Firm here in Tennessee. We're based out of Knoxville. Um, I uh, was brought on board to develop a division that solely focused on the motorcycle community, the needs of the community, um, uh, sponsorships, events, you know, you're a rider. There's so many things going on. And Garza Law Firm is a pretty well-established firm here, but felt they were missing that that part. So uh, they kind of stole me from uh, Knoxville and bootlegger Harley Davidson, where I was the marketing director uh, right. prior to this position. And um, yeah, we, we decided what could go wrong. We were creating something from scratch. Um, I've never done anything in this capacity. I'm a marketer. Uh, by trade. I've been marketing for 30 years. I just gave my age away, but (laughs) (laughs) that's okay. Um, But, you know, I'm a passionate writer myself. I have a deep rooted um, connection to the East Tennessee uh, since I moved here. So it just made sense that we were going to create this division that we really could focus on the needs of the writers here, whether it be legal, personal, just really make them feel special. And we're in our third year. This is our third year. Um, This April will be our three year anniversary of this. And yeah, it's been a a journey and adventure and constant, constant, always something yeah. going on. Well, so one of the things I really um, just want to just dive into is how did you get into riding motorcycles in the first place? Because, you know, as a woman, mm-hmm. there are not a ton of you. And I, nope. if I remember correctly, um, you are not necessarily a V-twin or a Harley person. You are more of a, what is your genre? A BMW. Yep, that's uh, right. Yes, I'm on my third BMW. Um, so how'd you get into riding? You know, Chris, every time I tell this story, so I have never in my life ever looked at a motorcycle and thought, man, I'd like to get on one of those. Never once. <laughs> um, in about 12, 12 years ago, I was engaged to a gentleman and he had four or five bikes, BMWs, Ducatis. Um, he was an av- he was a pilot, but he was also a rider. And one day he just said, do you want to go for a ride with me to the mountains? And I thought, oh God, I, I want to get on the back of this thing. Um, but I did. And I, I will remember it. And I mean, he would probably tell you the same story if, if he ever chose. But when we got off of the bike up in the mountains, it was probably about a three hour ride. Uh, I got off the bike and he literally just looked at me and said, mm, you're not the kind of woman that's going to ride on the back, are you? And I said, no, I am not. <laughs> and the very next day we went back to Charlotte and I bought my first BMW. I had bought the uh, BMW uh, G650. It was a dual sport right. bike. Um, paid five grand, thought I could beat it up. And, and I, I just started and I, I don't know what that switch, I don't know where it comes from. I got a long family history, you know, but I, I don't know where it came from. It was nothing I've ever entertained or wanted to do. But the minute I did it, you couldn't get me off. Um, you just couldn't. I, my children knew like, who is this woman? You know, where, that where's is mom? so cool. So, and I've been riding for 12 years now and I've, I've spent a lot of years just riding. I've always been lucky enough to have a remote job. One of my stipulations from the industry that I come from was any contract that I signed for employment, they had to make sure that the laptop would fit into my bike packaging. My, and it was, <laughs> it was written in my contract. So that is yeah, awesome. it's been a journey. <laughs> 
did you favor the BMWs just um, because that, that's what you were familiar with? Or have you, have you uh, shopped around and rid, ridden other bikes? I know you also have a penchant for uh, trackers and cafe bikes yeah, I'm a too. Die, I'm a diehard cafe racer junkie. Um, I try not to tell it out loud too much, but I, I, I love cafe bikes and, and they kind of get, they kind of get shade, right? Yeah. But um, they are super cool. Um, but I want to hear you, I, tell me what you well, like about cafes. I'll tell you, if you, if you get, if you get time, I'll tell you the history, a brief of where the name Cafe Racer came, but yeah. Yeah, I'd love I, it. No, I, tell us, tell uh, us. So Cafe Racer is actually a derogatory for it's actually a derogatory and it comes over, over the pond and, and in Europe where cafe racers bike, what it was, was gentlemen, did, they, they couldn't afford uh, a lot. So they take bikes and they strip them down and, um, truck stops, they were called cafes. There were cafes and they referred to them cafes and these guys would just hang out, you know, the greaser and, you know, the whole style and the, right. the leather jackets and they would hang out in these places. They'd strip their bikes down. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term, do the ton, um, a lot of people know it or not, and that's to do 100 miles an hour. So it became a competition for these young guys <laughs> to ride their stripped down naked bikes right. from cafe to cafe and see who could get there while they played music on the jukebox and see how fast you could get there before the next song came on. Well, truckers would make fun of them and, right. and say, you know, you're not even racers. You're just cafe racers. You're not even real racers. And that's where the term cafe racer comes from. That is funny. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, so um, one of my first bikes that I did, you know, just kind of restored on my own was a 1981 Yamaha SR500 Thumper. Mm -hmm. And um, I took it down to the frame and um, turned it into a cafe racer. And I don't think there's any way I could have pushed that thing to 100. I mean, I don't know, I don't know that I could have gotten it to 100. <laughs> I, you know, it amazes, it amazes me because, you know, where I am here in East Tennessee, but where I came from in Charlotte, my motorcycle circle was all cafe racers. Ducatis mm -hmm. and BMWs and, and we had the Harleys there, but you know, there's always that little, I don't know what it is about this tension between Harley and then, you know, yeah. these riders and trust me, being the marketing director at the time of Knoxville, Harley Davidson and riding a BMW, Ooh, it was tough. It was, Oh, I imagine you got some heat. Oh, I did. I, but they still lined up behind me when we, when we went on rides. <laughs> of course <laughs> they did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love BMW. <laughs> I love the engineering. If it, back to your point that you're asking why my first BMW was because obviously, you know, and I hate that whole cliche story. Oh, a guy got me into it. I really hate even saying it out loud. I feel like it demeans women that want to ride. He had BMWs. So the first one I got was um, a, a used BMW just to learn on. When I went to go get my second motorcycle, I did. I tried everything. I sat on, I wanted a Ducati. I, oh, just they're sexy. And I wanted one. Um, yep. but they didn't fit right under me. I wanted an Aprilia. I want, I went to Triumph. I did test ride Harleys. I just, I think for me, the Harley was more of a lifestyle. Like you had to kind of be, it's like Starbucks coffee to me. It's, it's really an environment. Right. Um, um, and it just, I wasn't in that circle. So, um, I sat on the, uh, BMW F800 ST, which was a, uh, sport touring bike and I was sold. I mean, it was, I love that bike and I, I, I bought it and I realized BMW is where I'm going to be. And eventually I moved on to the R9, the R9 T, which was an anniversary bike. It's a throwback to the cafe racer. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It's a sexy bike, but it's, I'm not a mechanic. So I needed something that looked like a cafe, but was brand new. <laughs> With the legit cafe, you know, rebuilds or customs, there's always oh. a lot of tweaking. Oh yeah. You're for sure going to be found on the side of the road somewhere at some point. <laughs> We've rescued quite a few of my friends back in Charlotte uh, with theirs, but uh, you know, BMW is good engineering I and mean, they were engineered by engineers for other engineers. That's just how BMW went. Um, I've never, ever had mechanical problems. You know, I take a lot of heat, you know, people will say, but I always say, make fun of me when you catch up. That's yep. what I say. <laughs> so what is like, <laughs> um, so, so you are not a, lifelong writer, I would say probably more than 50% of the, the folks that I've had on the podcast probably started out writing at a very young age yep. and have been lifelong writers. You're unique in that, that you have found it a little bit later than your childhood. And mm -hmm. um, how have you expressed that? Have you been mostly local writing? Do you like long distance? Do you like open road, interstate or back roads? What's your, what's your favorite thing to do? I like all of it. Um, Obviously, I, I'm i not a, uh, what do we call them? A cafe hopper. I'm not. I will. There's a bike night, of course. Um, I love long trips. Um, that's, I 
get made, if you, anybody knows anything about the R9T, you look at that bike and you go, there's no way that you take that bike 3000 miles. Oh yes, I do. Um, I have it down to a science on my bike that I can pack it for 10 straight days. And, I, and that's 10 days. I camp all my camping gear. The most important trip I ever took was right before I decided to leave my 20 year career in Charlotte, North Carolina right. and come, come to Knoxville. And it was a 3000 mile trip. I took up to Lake Ontario um, in Canada. And I, I just took 10 days to really find myself and where I wanted to be. Um, a lot of camping, Finger Lakes, the Erie that's Lake. That's cool. Went to Punxsahani and, but I'm a solo rider. I think that's what really shocks people most. I do not like to ride with anybody. I, I don't know why. I just don't. Um, the gentleman that I got me to the bikes, that relationship had ended and I learned most of my riding on my own. Well, he obviously didn't know you well enough if he thought you were going to be riding on the back in the first place. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> it, it didn't work. Um, um, and, but he was very supportive, I will say. I found a lot of freedom in riding. I was engaged, but I had just got out of a 17-year marriage. Um, and so, you know, any other woman will tell you it's defining. You know, we, we it was a hard, uh, it was a hard divorce. We lost everything we owned and things like that. So, I had been 20 years in sports nutrition and bodybuilding and fitness. I was a competitor. Like I, I seemed to only have one identity and the motorcycling gave me this new identity that all of the people in my life had nothing to do with. It was my own. Nobody could take it away. So funny that now here I am where I am now. It has become my identity. <laughs> so, um, but it has saved me. It saved me from um, some dark times. It's my, my daughter's super, super proud. I, they say I'm their hero. Um, they're very independent because they saw their mom do it. And I, I just think it's a statement for, but yeah, riding anywhere. I long distance. I, de I don't mind highway. It doesn't bother me yeah. at all. I'm the same way. I have, um, you know, I will do group rides, you know, mm -hmm. for a charity or whatever, mm -hmm. but, um, I vastly prefer just riding on my own. Yeah. And I've always thought I was a little bit weird because, you know, most people seem to like to ride in a pack, but Obviously, I've met way more people who enjoy riding in groups than riding alone. So I totally feel you. It's, it's a way to really just kind of meditate and mm -hmm. disengage and focus on something, you know, that requires your whole focus while you're doing it. It's kind yes. of cool. Yeah, And it's yours. Nobody can take it. I mean, people tell me all the time I want to ride with you. And I say, no, you don't. One, I may not come back. If you see anything packed on my bike, I may not come back. And right. I don't like having to worry. If I see a spot that I want to go to, I just want to go. I don't want to have to tell somebody, oh, or, or hey, I like this town. I'm going to stay here for two days and I might go on my journey. I, I'm very much like that. And I feel like inviting anyone to ride with me um, means I have to worry about their ride. And I don't want to. I know that sounds so selfish, but it's my it's mine. And I don't like anybody to be in it. That's I feel no, like that's, that sounds so selfish when I say no, it out loud. I think, well, so... <laughs> Anybody that knows you and knows how hard you work for the groups that you support knows that you are totally deserving of having something that is only your <laughs> own that you are not sharing yourself with because yeah. you spread yourself very thin. I think that you'll admit to that. Um, I, I and do. you're very dedicated. So you need to have your own thing. So mm -hmm. that's what really gets me excited about these podcasts is it's different to everybody mm -hmm. and everybody's story is so unique about what it means to them. But, you know, kind of at the root, you find, um, that everybody finds a degree of peace mm -hmm. in writing, um, and, uh, in something that's very, um, tranquil about doing something that it, you know, at times is not tranquil. <laughs> so a little danger. So, I think the danger yeah, yeah. aspect is always yep. something that pulls at us that, um, exactly. I think, I think when I ride alone also, I can cut it up a little bit more than I would want to be responsible for anybody else. You know, yeah. I've had a couple of people that have at, begged and begged and they, I think they underestimate my riding and they, they will ride with me. And I, I think in Tennessee, maybe three people have ever rode with me and they will come back and say, don't ride with her because <laughs> she don't <laughs> ride with her. And she's too um, fast. Uh, sometimes, but I like leisurely ride, you know, I'm not a knee dragger by any means. Um, I've ridden the dragon probably 30 times. Um, uh, I won't get on it anymore. That leads yeah. back to my job. There's a, there's a big reason. Sure. Um, I, you know, there, I live in East Tennessee. This is the Smoky Mountains. I've done the Blue Ridge Parkway nine times from beginning to end. Um, I, 
I love riding. I really do. Uh, yeah. Riding my bike. If I could magically transport my bike from my garage to where I want to go, I would never be off of it. Eventually, though, traffic and drivers starts to weigh on you, right? It, yeah. Uh, you know, you're a rider and you're a personal injury attorney, so I know you have full respect for that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, you do what you can and you, you get out there and shut the world off. And that seems to be where I, I do it at. So. Yeah. So you told us about your 10-day ride um, when you were transitioning from Charlotte to Tennessee. What are some of the other long rides that were kind of memorable to you that you've that you've done that you can tell us about? Well, one of the funniest ones I could tell you, I got stories for days, I, I tell you, um, when I, that G650 I had had, and I've done several, most of mine are camping. So that's another thing people underestimate. They see me out, you know, heels on wheels. They see me in heels and my makeup. I am a diehard camper. And when I say I'm talking, I will pull my motorcycle between some trees somewhere. And as long as I can pitch a tent and make a fire, that is where I will be. Um, so most of my riding has been, I've, I've, Speaking of Cafe Racers, I don't know if you ever remember, there was a show called The Cafe Racer Show. It was on Saturday mornings. Mm -mm. Mike Seat, um, who now runs the magazine, was the host of the show. Uh, and he, you know, I wasn't even writing when I loved the show. That's what makes it interesting. Um, he, this is one of the, one of my best memories of a ride. He, um, he puts on a Cafe Racer show for the magazine in uh, Swickley, PA. And I had corresponded with him about coming to this big show. So I rode my motorcycle up there and it from Charlotte to Pennsylvania. And I stopped and camped one night and made a good trip of it. But when I got there, um, I met him and we took photos and cafe racer. I mean, thousands of cafe racers. I was just in heaven, heaven, heaven. Plus I'm, that originally, would be from, awesome. yeah, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. So for me, it was great. But it was a couple months after that, where he did a write up about the actual cafe racer show. I still have the magazine today. There, somebody said, did you read the article yet? And I was like, no, let me go look. And in the article, it said, you know, what a successful show we had this year. And he said, but one of the most memorable moments to me was this, and this is his words, not mine. Okay. This beautiful woman rode her motorcycle all the way from North Carolina just to be at our show. And I reached out to him and said, I don't want to be presumptuous, but were you talking about me? And Mike contacted me back and then we started collaborating. I even actually wrote a six page spread in the Cafe Racer magazine uh, for him. Um, but it was that trip to Pennsylvania that the people you meet and I learned um, that it's called a ton up club, which is do the ton in Pittsburgh. Yep, they, that they, are, now. they are my they are my best friends. They come down here uh, for a show called The Meltdown. That's a Cafe Racer show. They come down every year. That's in Tennessee, The Meltdown. It's in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Okay, um, it's in the is. spring. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's one one of the shows I won't miss. But they come, they bring their whole group and ride down. So it's, I've been a lot of places riding that I haven't talked to a soul, right? But I've also been on rides where I come back with a hundred new friends. Um, I'm I'm animated, loud, and most people know me. You know me. Um, yes, yes. I You're I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Some would say obnoxious, but we'll go with that. Um, I am who I am and I don't make any apologies, but I, I meet a lot of people and I love hearing their stories. You know, I, I want to know them and what's going on in their life. And motorcycling opens you up to that. Um, so that's the weekly trip. It opened me up to the, the host of the Cafe Racer TV show. Really, to, to this day, we still communicate. Um, that was another one. The first time I rode the dragon <laughs> in 30 degree weather. On my G650, after only riding a motorcycle for three months, I thought I was. Oh my gosh! <laughs> hot dog, boy! I rode the dragon. I I, I think I went ten miles an hour. <laughs> it was cold, oh. and it, it, there's a lot of stories, but yeah, was every there, ride is unique. Yeah, hundred percent. There are almost nine million motorcycles registered in the United States, and there are almost five thousand motorcycle fatalities a year. That's almost fourteen a day. Motorists don't do a good job looking out for motorcycles and neither do insurance companies. Hi, I'm Chris Klotz and as a rider and an attorney, I know that insurance companies treat motorcycle cases differently. If you've been injured in a motorcycle accident, bring your case to me to review. Let me take my riding experience and my knowledge of how to deal with insurance companies to get you the compensation that you deserve. The call and the advice during the call are free. Stevenson Klotz Injury Lawyers, bring it. 
I know that you're working a ton right now. So I know yeah. that you're probably not doing the long distance rides as much, but uh, you got any cool rides or are you going to go to one of the cafe shows or? Yeah, I, I'm going to be at the meltdown um, in April. I think it's the end of April. I, they show up in I'm August. I'm writing that date down. Do you know April what for the meltdown? I want to say it's the 27th. Um, I'm writing this down. And I'll confirm make that visit. for you. Yeah. It's a good show. It's, it's, and plus, of course, all my Charlotte, I had to leave a lot of my friends behind. So they come there. Um, I want to go back up. Uh, th- I don't know if you know about the Mods versus Rockers. But that's a dream event for me to put on. I want to put one on here. And it's where the Mods versus the Rockers, you know, scooters. I'm big into scooters too, right? I forgot I've- about that. That's right. <laughs> I have this whole crew of people in Charlotte that they, listen, they will wear you out on a mic. You cannot keep up with them on a motorcycle. They are literally official racers but they will hop on their little scooters, go downtown to the bars. And, and it's, it's, it's comforting that they don't care. There's no stigma to them, right? You, you can't make right. fun of them. Um, so mods is that scooter crowd, you know, the, is the preppy. That because they're, is it because they're modded scooters yeah, I, or yeah, is it because yes. they're like the modern? Uh, I, no, I, the mods, mods versus rockers comes from back in the cafe racer where the story comes okay. from. There was always, you know, the the rocker and the gangster kind of feel. Right. And then there was the preppy college wealthy. Right. And they girls in their little skirts would ride their scarves and their scooters. Right. Gotcha, you envision gotcha. this. So this group of people would come against the cafe racers and they would come together and it would be called mods versus rockers. And they would there's events. The biggest one is in Chicago. That is one I want to go to. That's one I want to ride to. And it's. It's become huge. They don't call it that anymore. And I can't recall the gentleman's name. He's, I met him at the Cafe Racer Show. And I've asked him time and time ago, can I do, can I, can I put on a mod versus rock? You know, it's all pinup style and it's just a genre that I really love. Um, but yeah, mods versus, it, that would be one I'd love to ride out to is to Chicago to the mods, one of those big shows. That's, uh, that, that's just right up my alley too. I like that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your um, heels on wheels persona, brand. <laughs> Tell us all about what that's about. So I got the nickname um, because first of all, I'm always in heels. Yes. Everybody knows. Uh, when I upset my, my children are all adults, but when I upset them, they threaten me with burying me with Crocs on my feet. That is their big threat. <laughs> um, I always have heels. I, I own probably over 250 pairs of high heels. It's just who I am, my personal. So when I first started riding, I I, I do my hair. I, I never, you're never going to see me with a bandana or my hair in braids. I clip it. I wear full face helmet. I wear my motorcycle boots, which have embedded heels in them, by the way. Um, Joe Rocket makes it for women. There's a two and a half right. inch embedded heel. <laughs> so, but I would get to a bike night um, and or an event uh, or a brewery where we hung out and I would take my motorcycle boots off and I would always, I always had a pair of heels strapped to my bike. And I'd put my heels on and I would attend the event. And I've always lived by this in my motorcycle period of just because I ride a motorcycle doesn't mean I have to look like I ride a motorcycle. Right. And um, so after people started seeing me do that all the time, they, they started, they, I'd roll up and they're like, here comes heels. And it just stopped. <laughs> um, and then when I got, of course, uh, better in riding, I and I shouldn't be saying this because I am all about safety, but I, I do ride in high heels. There's a picture on the dragon that somebody mm-hmm. sent me one time in thigh high heel boots. They're like, is this you? And I was like, mm, ah, maybe not the best decision, but uh, so I am known to ride in heels and I actually ride better in heels. I mean, I wear booted heels, um, but if it's a charity event, I'm known to put on a pair of stilettos and there's photos of me in magazines with stilettos on riding the bike. Um, nobody can figure out how I do it. I, I don't know how they don't do it. But <laughs> kind of helps you hang on to the, uh, you it can just, like hang them on the, hang them on the pegs. <laughs> uh, yeah. On my back leg. Yeah. So it stuck. And then it just became uh miss heels on wheels. And then that carried over to obviously my career here and yep. the radio. When I do, I do several radio shows a week and they always refer to me as miss heels on wheels. And well, tell us, social- like give a plug for your radio shows and tell us what you do. Oh, I do a bike. I do. Um, right now we do hot spots for the weekend during the winter. Uh, and but where, during this, which markets are you going to find that in for the for um, our listeners? East, East Tennessee, all East Tennessee. It's WIMC. It's one of our biggest kind of um, uh, Southern rock kind of country, not country rock, just rock stations. And um, there was a gentleman here. His name was Billy Kidd. And he was a huge 
personality in motorcycling. I never got to meet him. Um, I had started the marketing position at the Harley shop um, when he was still here. Um, and then he was, he was the personality of this entire community. He did the camping for cans. He did the toy runs. Um, he was bigger than life and he passed away um, after slightly right after COVID. And he did a bike night report every week where he would get on WIMZ and he would talk about all the rides going on in the area or bike nights. And I, I remember the phone call um, from the radio station that had called me and said, we would like you to replace on that show. And it's a very short segment by means. It's not like a talking. It's just a quick segment. And I, I remember being so honored that how was I going to even replace something for Billy the Kid? Um, yeah. Billy Kid. So I, I started doing it. I just, I, I do, we've expanded. Now it's obviously the law firm sponsors it, of course. Now we, we sponsor it. So, and our market has expanded. So I do four radio shows a week now, um, two in Johnson City and two in East Tennessee. And it's a combination of a bike night report or a ride report where each segment, or I'll honor businesses or community partners, or um, if there's been a tragedy with maybe our military. I, I think the hardest and most emotional one I did was when the 12 soldiers were um, were were killed and um, several years back and I didn't even know what to do. And I just got on air and I just read their names Yeah, and it was just, um, you know, so, but I, yeah, I do that. I do a lot of social media. Um, right. I, I do a lot of, a lot of TV stuff here. Sometimes when we have a big event, I'll go on a show called East living tennis, living East Tennessee. Uh, yeah. I'm kind of known here. I like yep. it. Tell us a little bit about the firm, um, about um, Garza and what you do with them. And then I do want to, before we run out of time, I, I want to talk about, you know, what you do with Garza. Um, and they're, they're, they're a great firm. Um, and there's always room, you know, people are like, why are you having a, somebody else that's a PI lawyer come on oh, your goodness. show? It's like, there's always room for good people. Absolutely. And you guys are great people and very, very much, you know, value y'all's friendship. Um, but, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do with G the Garza law firm, but I do want to talk about a couple of things that are near and dear to our hearts, like UM and, and, yeah. you know, safety and stuff yeah. like that. So, but tell us um, about Garza. Well, Garza has been around for about 15 years. Marcos Garza, he's an attorney here. Um, he, um, was a Marine. He was a JAG. I want to so say that that'd be a judge advocate general, which is what JAG stands for. So he would yep. have been a JAG officer. Yeah. JAG officer. But, um, he's very well known here. Um, he's established. And uh, with three years ago, I was soliciting the firm to get them to sponsor our bike nights. Um, and anyway, through talks of that, he he brought me in. Um, and what I do is I just developed uh, a program where I, I am the liaison. I am the direct connection of the firm to the motorcycle community. If there's a motorcycle event going on in this area, um, I'm usually there and or our firm is sponsoring it. Uh, three years ago, when I joined the team, there was about 20, I think I told you about 20 employees and six attorneys. And now we have 72 employees, 18 attorneys and three offices. Wow. Um, you know, we, we focus on the Tennessee area. We, we uh, also do Kentucky. We were going to expand more, but we realized I couldn't, I couldn't even get out, out of this area. So um, we do a lot. We do a lot of our own creative events, but we sponsor, uh, there's a location here, Smoky Mountain Harley Davidson. It's the number one selling Harley Davidson in the country. There's a, place there on their property called The Shed, and it's a destination. It's a concert destination. It's where uh, a lot of motorcyclists all over the world come to. We sponsor that shed. We're out there pretty much every weekend. Um, we do a lot of community outreach, um, fundraisers, sponsor a lot of shows. Uh, I'm known for coffee and donuts. That's like my little niche thing that we do. Uh, you'll find me through the season somewhere with I don't know, 24 dozen donuts and six per <laughs> six percolators. And I've gotten to the point now where I even bring ice and make ice coffee for people. It can get crazy. But we um, we educate the community on their rights as motorcyclists, as I don't have to share what that means to you. Yep. And tell us about, a little bit about what your opinions and feelings are about UM or uninsured motorist coverage. Yeah, I'm a diehard um, advocate. See, it, I don't want to get into the story too much, but the first case I and I and I am allowed to speak freely of this. Um, but the first case I ever brought to the law firm was as I was finishing my last couple days at Harley Davidson, my best friend was killed on her bike. And it was the first case that I brought. It was a difficult case. Um, and it was an eye opener of actually what I was about to dive into for the next three years. 
distracted driving, um, the lack of insurance. Uh, Tennessee is third in the whole country of uninsured drivers. One in six drivers here has no insurance at all. And I think motorcyclists, um, I, I, my first and foremost passion is to get them to understand uninsured motorcycle insured, UM, UIM, that and max it out because the driver that hits them is either going to have nothing or the bare minimum, 25000 and a broken arm on a motorcycle. You're not going to be covered. And full coverage on your bike does not cover anything like that. So UM and UIM kick in when the driver at fault insurance is not there. And you yep. know, as an attorney, everyone thinks, well, we'll just sue them. You, you, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't. Nope. So and I also know lots of people who say, oh, I've got full coverage on my mm-hmm. bike. And I'm like, full coverage is a word that means nothing. Absolutely. Full coverage does not mean you have uninsured motorist coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to have in Florida, at least you have to have the coverage on your bike policy, having uninsured coverage on your car and then getting hurt on your bike. UM only covers you if you have it on your bike policy in Florida. Yeah. Every so. state is different. You know, I study there's stacking. You can do Kentucky stacks. If you have UM on your car and your bike, you can stack it in accident. That's, that's, that's a whole nother podcast you should do, but it's very yep. important that riders need to know that we have to stop. I know this is a hard topic and I'm hard on motorcyclists. I am hard on them. Um, I support you and advocate for you, but I will call you out every day and tell you what you need to be doing. We, it is irresponsible because here's the deal, Chris, when there's an accident, let's say the worst case scenario, the, this person's killed or severely catastrophic injuries, and you call us to help organize a ride or fundraise for the family. I'm all for it. We are there. We are never going to turn you down. But it is time that riders acknowledge they have to be responsible to be sure that they have coverage for these things because drivers are not. And we can't keep just saying drivers are out of control. Somebody's got to... That's that's how it is. And until the laws change, it's going to stay that way. Be responsible. Get UM, get UIM. I spend six dollars extra a month on my insurance policy to have three hundred thousand dollar covered the max you can have. So if I get hit by somebody who only has twenty five thousand. Gar's the law, I know, is going to go get that three hundred thousand for my family. They're going to get that money. I take responsibility for that. I don't rely on the driver out there. To, to yeah. have it just like so, so that is something I'm deeply passionate about, and I I hold seminars here, and we'll we'll do breakfast. We have a thing called Fueled Up Friday. You can come get your gas tank filled up on your bike if you show me you have UM or you listen to me why I explain why you have to have it. Oh, that's um, a great idea. Yeah, you have it. You're welcome. It's a really good. It works <laughs> out really well. It's fun. We, it, we're coffee donut people, uh, but yeah. So that's the big thing that I'm passionate about, and and the firm, um, and and also, I'm not um, I'm not past saying. We work hard to make sure that the the community loves us and we don't want anyone in the community to have an accident or be hurt, Um, but it happens. And all we can do is hope that they trust us to service them. Um, But a lot of times you you work out in the community, you're you're working so hard to get them and you get get cases and there's nothing you can do for the families because there just wasn't the insurance. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, that's, and we started out like you guys did, you know, just getting all of the safety information out there that we can because there's yeah. a lack of resources for safety information. Yeah. And it seems to be that lawyers just kind of seem to be the ones that are t- kind of, as far as promoting safety, seem to be one of the more active groups. It's ironic, isn't it? Out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of so people anyway. will say, You're, we promote safety. If I, we never took another motorcycle case in from this day forth, I would be perfectly content in finding a different career. And that's the truth. If there was never another motorcycle accident, Garza Law has stated it from the beginning, I would be fine to do my other law if we could prevent it from happening. Amen. Well, April Violet, heels on wheels. We are, I'm looking at my clock. It looks like we are probably about out of time. Oh. I have had the best time. Oh, Hadn't this gone by? I told I, you it would go by fast, I know. It? You start me get talking. I'm just, we'll stay and on And I forever. haven't even gotten to talk about poker or cigars okay. Or, yeah. or 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 tearing your walls out of your house yeah. to, to do your remodel and your do yeah. it yourself stuff. I do. So I'm gonna have to have you come back. You Anytime. Come back sometime? You, absolutely. Let me know. I'm, I, I need right. to come down your way and ride a little bit down there. <laughs> well, I've got I've got the meltdown written down, and that's the one that's in Hendersonville. Is that right? Yes, that one's coming up. And then okay, the I'm, cafe I'm probably, show. 
Yeah, I'm going to text you about that because I I want to go to I want to see one of the cafe shows. That'd yeah. be awesome. It's so. a smaller one, but it's good. The one in Swickley is the big one, but that's in August. Okay. If you ever want to go, see if you can ride all the way from Pensacola all the way <laughs> to up there. That'd we could do right. it. Chris Biker Dad does it all the time. I know, so, I know. I just talked to him the other so, day, so yeah. Right on. All right, well, April. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you soon. We'll uh, catch you next time, everybody. This is Chris Klotz with the Stevenson Klotz Law Firm. We are here on Motorcycle Hang Time with April Violet with the Garza Law Firm. Thank you so much for showing up, and we will catch you next time. Thanks for hanging out with us on Motorcycle Hang Time with Chris Klotz. Go to stevensonklotz.com to get more information about motorcycle safety issues and motorcycle law. Please leave us a rating and a review whenever you listen to your podcast. We invite you to spend time with us on our next episode.